Hey. Hey, Ted. How are you? Uh, how's it going, amigo? Nice to see your face, and I'm very excited about this. Pro you know, I've been excited about your project, and and uh, you know, ever since I you know inadvertently learned something about it somewhere, made some kind of comment somewhere, and then. Well, I just wanted to like briefly introduce you and the show and the station. So uh, the the station or the the actual show that we're producing here is part of getmansvirtual.com and get getmans virtual book and paper fair and they have a new exhibition or virtual fair coming up which is usually the greenwich village uh antiquarian book and paper fair uh in a live setting but this year it has to be virtual because of covid of um, course so anyway I, I i'll just give a little bit of background on us we kind of already started talking about it a little bit my dog's playing with her toy in the back no worries i love it for <laughs> fun and had to do that but um so we uh came in contact like you said a couple years ago um you contacted me through my website about this gentleman oh yeah you can all see it but this is a picture of eden abi or eden abes who wrote the song nature boy in 1948 and Eden's Island album in 1960 and was sort of a harbinger to the flower power and psychedelic movement of the later 60s and early 70s. And um, you contacted me and I should let everybody know that your nom de plume is uh, Barefoot Ted. And according to, from what I can tell from your, um, your Instagram feed, you are quite the uh, exercise guru and holistic uh you know lifestyles person as well as you make sandals and the reason that we're talking today is because you have um an immense collection which you brought to my attention of this gentleman here oh yeah you got that on ebay recently didn't you jay william lloyd yeah I, well good i knew good job. I doing this and i had yeah. had him in all my different searches on amazon yep, yep. E books and everything and i was waiting for something good to come up and finally, Dude, oh, in about fabulous. 10 seconds after it came up, I got an email and I said, all right, I'm doing this interview with him. I have to have a copy of something here. Oh, um, dude. Okay. I mean, it, what's wonderful about that little pamphlet, I mean, it, to go right into it is it's printed just down the street from where I am right now. It was, yeah. a, it was a very interesting Red Rose Press. Uh, our, so, I mean, we'll get into it. I mean, it's a big topic, but Lloyd really inspired a lot of people. I mean, he comes out of this interesting era. Um, God, he's so diverse. And a lot of, there were so many different ways things were going at that time. But it's Greenwich Village has an interesting underlying important role in all of this, um, in this story of Lloyd, primarily because a guy named Benjamin R. Tucker who was a publisher of a magazine called Liberty. He was, he was at the Boston Globe. He created this sort of for 30 years, was publishing it, opened a bookstore on Fifth called The Unique Bookshop, which ended up being kind of an early harbinger of what, would, what was happening over at Greenwich Village based on my own research. And the reason I even mentioned in that is that, that pamphlet you got, the scripture of a, the serene life, um, it's a it's an interesting sort of um, conglomeration of trying to take everything Lloyd is about and his experience and he lived a pretty long time and condense it into something that still is like anything condensed God so complex and difficult to interpret but the more I learn about his life the fuller and the more meaningful that pamphlet is but unbelievably that same Red Rose Press in 1927 published another book that turns out the more I'm doing research on it becomes, I mean, I'm just gonna segue into it a little bit because it's such a fascinating book. It's a book called um, Nature's Brotherhood. And it's by a dude named Saladin Reps. And Saladin eventually changed his name back to what everyone knows him as, as Paul Reps. He was in Greenwich Village. He was dating this lady, Adele Kennedy. He was researching philosophical topics at the New York Public Library. She suggests that he looks into some Eastern stuff. He ends up going to um, uh, China, Japan, and somewhere in the Far East. He ends up coming back kind of at a depth of um, 
everything from like Rumi and the and and um, all kinds of cool stuff. But he writes this book called Nature's Brotherhood, published at the Red Rose Press in 1927. And mind-bogglingly, some of the main characters that and indeed the last two voices in the book, it's a bunch of like little fairy tales basically, is a husband and wife sandal couple. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I mean, it's like, you can't make this stuff up. And the little, uh, I mean, I, it seems like it's appropriate to start this a little bit because it connects with Abby and whatever. But finally, this whole group of critters who have had stories throughout the book have assembled together. Who's the humblest of them all? And finally, the wife Sandal speaks. And she, I'm just going to read a few of her lines as she speaks for the first time. No one's heard her. The little beloved began, I... I don't know what to say. I never spoke before. Whoever loves will be loved and who will sink the well of his love deep enough shall drink the waters of immortality. And then she goes on and on some interesting things. And then she says, all beings are of one love. Receiving this is simpler than the breathing of a flower. Hey, let's go back for a second and, and you know, maybe uh, you can set the stage for us about um, who J. William Lloyd is and how you got interested in him because, or how you found out about him, because he's, you know, my association with the California pre-hippie movement, the, the, you know, the people from the late 19th century up through the 1940s, uh, we're all people that I learned about through this book, which That's is right. yep. my copy is pretty well worn at this point. But uh, Children of the Sun by Gordon Kennedy, basically. Excellent book. Yeah. Yeah. He chronicles all these late 19th century nature lovers, uh, anarchists, um, communal living people, utopianists, uh, back to earth lovers and whatnot in Germany and how in the early 20th century, when things started getting a little bit more militant and industrial there they made themselves they made their way to kind of the open paradise of california particularly southern california and started living in caves started living in little grottos and hamlets like tohunga and santa barbara and setting up you know kind of little nature shops and nature communes and writing books about you know non-mucus diets and things like that that have really become classics in the field and then some of those Germans ended up becoming mentors to more famous characters in pop culture, like Gypsy Boots, who was sort of this nature guru who appeared on the Steve Allen show a lot, and Eden Abbey. Yeah, there you go, Bare Feet and Good Things to Eat, the classic. And, and, and of course, Eden Abbey, who, oh. who wrote Nature Boy, and many, many, many other pre-psychedelic, pre-flower power songs and was seen with Brian Wilson and, and Donovan and Tom Waits and all kinds of luminaries that really spread this kind of like eco-consciousness and alternative lifestyle. So it's like, you know, from this book to them seemed very clear. And then I met you and out of the blue, it became, no, there was also an American and this American named J. William Lloyd ended up lo and, lo and behold, being actually a friend with John Richter who owned the Eutrophians uh, Raw Foods Cafe on Laurel Canyon in Hollywood, where Eden and Gypsy Boots and the other nature boys played music. And Eden okay. actually lived in Richter's backyard. And then Lloyd has the book, The Scripture of the Serene Life, as well as one called, uh, what is it? Nature Man, A Romance of the Golden Age. Oh yeah, yeah. Which if you put those two together, yeah. then you get Abby's final work. Oh yeah. I think there's I think there's going to be some stuff we're going to find some connections but this book this is a great book the the natural man by Lloyd it's really beautifully made book um uh 1900 in it and then there's a sequel to it called Vale uh Dweller the Dwellers of Vale Sunrise and these two books end up um playing a big role in inspiring a bunch of more intentional communities that existed and we get into that. There's one that Freedom Hill Henry, <laughs> what a character. I mean, actually I should share my screen for a second. I, I have pulled up here. I think I sent you this before, but check this out. Oh, you have to allow, uh, if you want to see this or share this, this is um, Freedom Hill Henry's son, um, Harper Beach Henry. Do you see this guy? You've seen this picture? Yeah. This is like, okay. This is uh, 1924, 
a guy in the LA Times, he's connected to Freedom Hill Henry, who is this, um, Lloyd ends up moving from New Jersey to Southern California in the early 1920s to become, sort of live on the outskirts of this place called Freedom Hill, Freedom Hill Henry's Freedom Hill. <laughs> and the characters and people who lived here, I mean, it's just completely outside most people's like, oh, wow, people could think like that and be like that in the, in the day. And the fact of the matter is, yes, there were some very interesting um, different ways of living and thinking and being. And it turns out, even though Kennedy's book is, you know, Children of the Sun is super important, um, that Top Keats Canyon and all the things in Santa Barbara, there's, you know, an organic food. And I mean, so many things are all swirling around and you can start finding and connecting the dots and seeing where they go. And a big part of it is coming from Germans and insights like that. But what I'm finding now, and it's gone even deeper and deeper as I've studied more, try to catch up and understand all the layers of Lloyd himself, is that there's this huge kind of movement. It becomes aggrandized in this magazine called Liberty, which is like the outcropping of almost basically from about the early 1800s through all the way through until about 1870s when this guy Benjamin Tucker starts getting focused on it and then it becomes this magazine. There's this innumerable numbers of attempts at trying to find out what will be the, um, what are some of the right ways to move forward as, you know, in a, as pioneering human beings in a completely clean slate, well, more or less to some degree, what do, what do we, how we're all socialized be? And you have this whole group of people, I mean, they end up getting, I mean, it's such an impossible to make a statement like this in an average uh, uh, household or in, in the world, anarchists. I mean, anarchism, what the hell is this? You know, it sounds like, you know, is this bomb throwing people? Is this the sex pistols? What the hell's going on here? But it's basically this underground, underlying movement, it gets, ended up getting this title, individualist anarchist, anarchism. I mean, it's a crazy title. What the hell does that mean? But you get this kind of underlying mm, anti-authoritarian sort of anti-monopoly, um, uh, this attempt at trying to like find the greatest expression of freedom in living and interacting such that the individual him or herself becomes the un... Uh, uh, don't mess with the individual. Basically, if you can get individuals to flower or do their thing or find their way, or because that's the most interesting thing that exists in the universe, these guys are saying. And at the same time, they have this desire to collectivize or, or come together. And so they got this, there's these crazy terminologies like anarchistical socialists. You know, it's like, what the hell? You know, it seems like, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to glom onto the exciting new opportunities of being able to be a free thinker, a critical thinker, go anywhere you want, study any topic you want, look under the hood of anything you want. And they started looking under the hood of all the cool stuff, like free love is one of the topics that comes up and what is our, why are we compelled to get married or how is it that families are formed and what happens if we don't want to use religion or any kind of authority as our, whether it's state or church, by the way. These guys are anti-statists. They literally are not interested in having a state because they see everywhere, 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 the state being used to wreak violence on people, either between states or inside states. They just see it and they start writing. This guy, Benjamin Tucker, who's a very bright cookie. I mean, he's from New Bedford, Massachusetts, from a wealthy whaling family. He doesn't go to Harvard because it's too... Well, they're too religious. He, he ends up going to MIT. He graduate. He leaves at 19 because it's too slow for him. And he starts doing all his things. But he starts becoming this intellectual who is desperately worried about what happens when states get too much power. And then the programs they back with cronies and all the rest ends up becoming forced on everyone else. And he is scared as hell about what's coming in the early 20th century. He knows. He sees he sees totalitarianism, he sees all that's going to come down the road, and he's like, basically, he gives up, his, his bookshop gets burned down in, in um, Greenwich Village in 1908, 
And by soon after that, he inherits some money. He's like, I'm out of here, man. I can't take it anymore. And he goes, he basically retires and leaves the country. But it's a very, this, I'm bringing this up because Lloyd finds himself in the 1880s, a young man wanting to see what he can, you know, he's pretty intelligent. He grew, his parents were from Wales. He grew up on a farm in New Jersey New, um, and uh, was uh, wanting to see the world. He's close to New York. He's able to get to Boston. He ends up getting in a medical college that is the only one that gets a, uh, it's called hygiotherapeutics. And it's kind of like a, it's a preventative medicine sort of thing. It ended up catching on more in Germany. Uh, Knepp, a very famous uh, hydrotherapist, whatever, is still going to this day. But in the U.S., it got snuffed out. There was one college in New York City. It ended up moving to New Jersey to a better location. It was getting some support from some people in legislation. It was a very crazy time in medicine. Allopathic medicine was becoming the rage. And there was, you know, this school was an anti-drug, drug free school. It was about hygiene. It was about lifestyle habits and so forth. Lloyd is in the, his class to be the, to graduate. The founder dies. By the way, the first woman doctor comes from this college. The founder dies and Lloyd finds himself basically having to start experimenting on what it's going to, you know, with a young wife and some kids and he starts on his own and he ends up participating in a few uh, intentional communities. I mean, he, he just, his life is just like filled with one adventure after another all over the country. He's um, beginning to interact with other, let's say, radicals, people who are, um, you know, not just following the whatever the current thoughts were of the day, but we're actually just exploring, you know, this, all this newness. And so everywhere he would go, he would, he would just, you know, study and, and learn about whatever it was. And, if he, and when he started getting, he got attracted to this uh, anarchistic, well, I guess you'd call it almost libertarian now, but he makes a strong, interesting case that the New Englanders who were getting attracted to some of the, let's say, freer, uh, individualistic sort of um, uh, conceptions of what it was to be American, they were getting this from indigenous cultures. And this is, Loy indeed writes an essay. I just recently read it and I was like, whoa, this is what I thought I was going to see and yet I see it. By the way, Benjamin Tucker also is the first person to publish Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. He's not a small fry, you know, that's a significant, pretty big, you know, um, achievement along with translating a prodhound and others. So it's like a Lloyd gets himself in that mix. And so I'm telling you from there, you start seeing very people who are willing to study and say anything if it captures their attention, whether or not it's acceptable or not. Yeah, and, and I feel like um, this, you know, brings me to kind of my next question, which I'll start with just saying that this what you're talking about doesn't really sound to the traditional narrative a lot like what we consider the Victorian era in Europe, England, or especially America. It sort of flies in the face of both, you know, sort of the, the, the traditional, uh, you know, educational framework of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, and then as it moves on, I know that Gordon Kennedy with his Children of the Sun thesis and, and me with uh, trying to put, you know, the Nature Boys and especially the music of Eden Abbey in this kind of like radical framework that presages the mid 1960s and Leary and Kesey and all that. And, 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 and in, you know, in sort of that Rolling Stone magazine, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, uh, San Francisco centric way of framing things up, this all really flies in the face of that. And so we've all had, you know, significant resistance to the idea that, that uh, the so-called hippie thing in the United States had been going on for 60 to 80 years prior to that, maybe even before. And so I guess, you know, because this is a, the show is particularly about collections You've amassed a collection that is really one, as far as narrative, outside of like, you know, traditional ideas of collecting, you know, what, what we know about the 19th century. But there's a lot of curators, there's a lot of librarians, there's a lot of collectors, there's a lot of obsessives like myself 
that are looking for this alternate history of America. And this is such a fascinating thing. And I'm wondering, because like the scripture, the serene life has this very almost uh, Art Nouveau meets symbolism character on the front cover. There seems to be this kind of blend of Eastern mysticism, um, transcendentalism for sure. The, these, you know, very ecstatic, um, almost Nietzschean way of looking at um, pain and suffering as a gateway to transcendence. You take all of your bliss and all of your sadness and say yes to everything. Um, you know, and so it's like, in a way, Lloyd and maybe some others become sort of a funnel for that in bringing it to California. Now, you know, it's different when you have the Germans, they're, they're, they bring Nietzsche with them. Lloyd seems to be bringing more of like the American transcendentalists to the West, which I've never really found anyone who's actually brought Emerson or Whitman or some of the other lesser known figures that you're talking about from the East Coast to the West. So that makes him fascinating to me, especially because it sort of gets repackaged in this very California aesthetic, you know, and, and, and that's something that's way outside, you know, uh, any, any kind of, uh, you know, journalism or history that I've seen done on California so far. So that's to me what makes it exciting. And I would love to see maybe some of the books that you consider to be kind of his his road to utopia, you know, how, yeah. how, how do you kind of see his story in terms of objects playing out? Wow, it's, it's a great, I mean, you're so, I mean, perfect setup for, yeah, this, so one of the things that, so of course I read Kennedy's book and I was just going, but there's these other things I gotta, how do I, and we're just now starting to kind of get, and it's so wonderfully in Eden in the, let's say Eden being the, the kind of an interesting character because he sort of takes in all of these in a, in a beautiful way, so many of these different kinds of openings that were that were available in let's say california this great place where and it's it's connected believe it or not to the beach and surfing and all kinds of this, these vast open uh, uh uh nature uh landscapes and so forth and so on and the opportunity to be anything you want try anything new but on that take i've got this thing i'm working and now that i've got found you know uh, you know, I, I've got this incredible story. It's about surfing and, and it gets to Eden and other things that goes all the way back to Melville and um, who happens to be, you know, he starts out at, in New Bedford, the same place where I'm talking about Benjamin Tucker. There's like this incredible, it's a, it's a quite a successful little town and also in its, um, let's say its education and its an intellectual life, it's like, you know, these are people going all over the world. They they have on the street corner, you know, Frederick Douglass lives there. He runs on the ticket as vice president to the first woman to run as president, whom Benjamin Tucker was sleeping with when he's 19 and he's at MIT. She's in her 30s. It's a, I forget her name, Claude, Cladwell or something. Anyway, it's like, a, this is a really interesting place. And, um, and much more radical, I think, than we're- Much more radical. My, people don't understand. They, and, and, capable of funding their radicalism. They have businesses and connections and things going on. There's all these new, and they're, you know, trading, the cities that became great at trading, they don't give a crap what you think or believe. They want, you make it, you say you're gonna bring something here and pay this much and I bring it and you pay that much, boom, we're building a relationship. We don't really give a crap. If we totally understand each other, stay out of my way, I'll stay out of yours. And hopefully over time, those negotiated transactions end up building a kind of a relationship. I mean, this is simplified. But Herman Melville writes a book called Taipei. Taipei, I will, I am may, now making the argument, Taipei sets in motion an imaginative wonderland that didn't exist for anybody before of people living out in the obscure middle of nowhere who are actually living way better than any European ever lived and much more beautifully and all the rest by, and that story inspires a lot of people, but most importantly in our story today, it inspires a dude named Jack London, who after he makes his money writing whatever he does, I mean, whatever, he, his dream is to get in a boat and go to the island where Taipei was written, what is about. 
And on that voyage, he has to go through Hawaii, of course. And while there, he learns to surf. And he writes the first essay on surfing that ends up getting into the Women's Home Journal or what. It, like, it gets all over the place. And it has such a heroic, beautiful, you know, these, these men who basically, and women, who become living gods by being able to do this particular act, riding the wave. I mean, let's face Mercury it. Mercury with wings on their feet is how he describes George Freeth, one of the Waikiki Beach Boys. Totally. So it's like this, this imagery. It's like so powerful, right? And then you've got this guy named Ernest Darling. And one of the other essays that London writes is about the nature man, Ernest Darling. Ernest Darling, London meets in San Francisco before he goes on his trip. He starts sailing his boat into Papiti, and this guy comes out, he's raving a red flag, and he's this crazy bearded naked guy, and it's the nature man. And Ernest Darling is, that's the guy. He inspires a bunch of others, including Bill Pester and others, who, it's the Hawaii, go to, there's this, there's a whole bunch of Germans too, are coming, the whole movement of the, Back to nature movement starts around this time. Ernest Darling being one of the first. Ernest Darling being in an essay on the same group of essays that are about surfing and London knowing him before he goes there. And he's a crazy dude who's at Stanford. He's sickly. Everything's going to hell. He thinks he's going to die. He almost dies. He says, shit, I'm going to do whatever I can. He turns out being naked and living out in nature heals his ass. <laughs> so, you know, we start this. And Lloyd is friends with Darling. They write letters together. And there's another journal called, um, ah, damn. Anyway, there's so much cool stuff. Back to Lloyd. Some of the keys. He writes those two books I showed you, The Natural Man and The uh, Dwellers of Vale Sunrise. Um, this book, Dw Dwellers of Vale Sunrise, a guy at uh, University of Cal um, Vese writes a book in the early 70s about um, communal life and stuff and he writes a whole essay about this book and he says in this book is the first representation in imaginative literature of the American hippie and it's a interest I mean it's a could conceivably be so um, it's an interesting story but this is all about utopianism he starts out with a quote from uh, Oscar Wilde and it's it's like it will be a marvelous thing, the true personality of man, when we see it. It will grow naturally and simply, flower-like, as a tree grows. It will not be at discord. It will not be always meddling with others or asking them to be like itself. It will love them because they will be different. And yet, while it will not meddle with others, it will help all, as a beautiful thing helps us by being what it is. It will be a wonderful, it will be as wonderful as the personality of a child. Is this utopian? A map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out and seeing a better country sets sail. Progress is the realization of utopias. Oscar Wilde. I mean, it's... A, it's pretty cool stuff, in my opinion. I like it. Oh, I think it's incredible. I mean, you know, my big obsession when I was a teenager was I was, you know, really into like the birds and Phil Spector and Zappa and the Beach Boys especially. And someone gave me that picture of Brian Wilson with Eden Abez. And then I ended up getting, you know, an early CD reissue of Eden's Island, which is itself kind of a musical utopia. Oh my God, awesome, awesome album. You turned album. me onto that, yeah. Yeah, concept album way before Tommy and Dark Side of the Moon and all that. And and I've sort of been obsessed with that idea of what was Eden's Island in, in, in the greater vision of Eden's, you know, musical and artistic cosmology. But then, you know, it's really opened so many doors for me, like the one you're presenting here to get into other, you know, literary and, and artistic versions of Utopia and Paradise and all that. And, and you know, it's so fascinating as this kind of like simulation that we can compare with the reality that we live in and say, you know, can we move our reality into how would this simulation apply? Can we put these things to test and see how they work? And I guess my next question, and I should let you know, 
that we're probably going to have to go into a part two on this because we only have maybe 10 more minutes and it's it, it. going to cut off per show. But it's such an interesting topic. And it, and I feel like, you know, one of the big things that I, I'm more, I'm interested in exploring for as much time as we have left and on into another conversation is how much of this did Lloyd via his publishing actually be able to put into practice? Was he able to seed any of these intentional communities? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, he, it, so Lloyd, I'll, t I'll end it with this just to show you how heavy Lloyd really is. And it's getting, the deeper I dig, the more I see is just, he's a lost figure, but he need not be, he should not be. And I will say this, certainly Aldous Huxley has got to be considered an important character in the story of sort of like opening doors of perception and imagining. And it turns out when Huxley first came to LA, um, in his, you know, his, his, in the beginnings of his own, let's say, more and more research on um, uh, obscure things that ends up becoming the, I think it's called the perennial philosophy, and then he goes on to write, of course, books on experiences with psychedelics and all the rest. In one of his letters that's in the Huntington Library now, he is actually, it's considered quite an amazing letter because it's pretty deep. Oh yeah, there's Lloyd when he's older, quite a bit older, I guess. And I'm not exactly sure where that is, but that's a good one. He's got some good photos throughout many of his book pieces. Also, actually, on, on the Nietzschean concept, he actually, at the end of his book called, here's a book called Life's Beautiful Battle. Very follows, Nietzschean title. Yeah, and it's very, it's coming after a book called Don Thought. This book called Don Thought, written in 1900 originally, which I think has a picture of him. He's very, he's looking very New York City here like yeah, dapper, yeah. you know, I mean, he goes through different phases. Um, he has this kind of, um, he's going, he's, tr he's commuting in on the train to New York City each day. He's taking care of a lunatic boy, I think is one of the titles. Um, uh, nonetheless, he has this kind of uh, ep epiphany that ends up uh, turning into this book that he kind of almost just writes as it comes and it becomes, I mean, it's a really beautifully made book. It's got like, you know, the, the lettering, it's almost like a holy book, it's, you know, like that. And it, it has, I would say it's that kind, it's writing from that perspective of like a teacher, you know, he gets to the end of his life and he writes a book, My Interpretation of, of Truth and Life, and basically just says, you're going to figure it out. There, what's the truth? It's this crazy vehicle called you trying to figure it out. And as long as you're authentic and certain, you're going to find your own way and you have to learn how to, it's like your responsibility. Here's some of the things. I learned if it works well for you, go ahead and apply it. Otherwise, you know, go to the next, go somewhere else. But back to Aldous Huxley, him and Aldous Huxley write, he turns Aldous Huxley onto another very interesting character in the spiritual world of California, a guy named Franklin Merrill Wolf, who's this uh, Stanford mathematician who goes to Harvard. He gets the San Francisco club of Harvard club, sends him to Harvard. He studies with uh, Wein Wiener when he's there, Norbert Wiener, who ends up becoming cybernetics. And they, they get blasted off by the math that they're learning from the same guy that ended up working, Hilbert, who worked with Einstein to develop the math that told the story of general relativity. It's blowing their fucking minds, literally. And this guy, uh, Franklin Merrill Wolf, basically takes his understanding of infinity and he basically starts on a path and he starts studying Eastern stuff and other things. He ends up ensconced in a little setting at the base of Mount Whitney, the highest mountain in the U.S., and lives there 98 years. Lloyd's friends with him. Lloyd reads his first manuscript in the 30s called Pathways Through to Space. It's like his, his uh, story of his transformation is his enlightenment. And then Aldous Huxley's writing, Lloyd's turning him on to him. They become friends and ultimately it all comes back to the craziest craziest dude on this journey in our lifetime is that dude, um, uh, John C. Lilly. I don't know if you've heard of that guy, but he goes way out there, um, ultimately at the end of his life. And he's going to Franklin Merrill Wolf's house in Lone Pine to help republish his books and say, this is the dude, this dude's got it. I just went and visited that place uh, at Joshua Tree and then over to that place uh, late last year with my wife. And it was like, whoa, I met the, you know, it's just trippy. So that's, so Aldous Huxley, at the end of Aldous Huxley's life, or at the end of Lloyd's life, Lloyd dies in 1940, 
Aldous Huxley's come in and has some of Lloyd's stuff and interacts with Lloyd and sort of continues on. So Lloyd has an interesting, he's an interesting character and he's bright, his mind is sharp. He's writing books all the way till his end. He wrote a really incredible book called, I mean, for its modern outlook, From Hill Terrace Out Looking. And he's, he basically sees World War II coming. He's seeing a lot of the, uh, the displaced young people coming through, you know, like I'm sure how uh, in the coming years, Eden would look like showing up, you know, destitute, but somehow making a way and living this entirely other way. But hard culture is not liking those people. That doesn't look right. They're, you know, that's too much freedom. We don't want, you know, stay in line, get in the, you know, like that. Go clean your shave yourself, you know, blah, blah, blah. You've dug something out of that has really been lost. And uh, I, you know, I'm happy, so happy that, you know, I was able to give you a little bit of a forum, but I think what you're doing is so important. And I really applaud the, the effort and work that you put into it and just managing to bring that whole collection together. Because even just looking at what little there is on the internet, they barely trace him to California. There's no mention of John Richter or any of the associations that he had with sort of the next generation in the 40s and 50s. There's no mention of Aldous Huxley. There's certainly no mention of the Nature Boys and their influence, which we know can, went, took all of this into music and into popular culture. So anyway, well, to be continued, and thank you again, Ted. This was so cool and so enlightening. What an amazing episode. And uh, I definitely want to get talk to you after this and set up part two to, to complete Lloyd's story. But right now, on now. Let me sign off on the recording before it cuts us off. I think that's a good place to stop. Take care, brother. Right on, man. See ya.